everyone. My name is Lauren Smith and I am a PhD candidate at UCLA. And today I'll be talking about uh, comparing a key ecosystem function, resource subsidies provided by invasive Sargassum horneri and native Macrocystis pyrifera rack. Before I get into that like kind of complicated title, um, I just want to talk about why invasive species are important. Um, they're reshaping ecosystems worldwide. They've led to a loss of biodiversity. Uh, so this is a photo of an island where invasive goats are present and goats are kept on this side of the fence and not this side of the fence. You can see a loss of um, that kind of grass. Species extinctions, um, of species with known causes of extinctions, invasive species are solely responsible for 20% and however are actually implicated in 54% of species extinctions. The loss of ecosystem services. So this is um, a personal boat uh, that somebody has and it's been fouled with invasive kawaga mussels. A loss of ecosystem function. Uh, so in this example, this is kudzu that's reducing the kinds of habitats. So what actually is an invasive species? Um, you kind of have to follow a couple rules to become invasive. Um, so this is a definition that I use. It's a species that has been introduced to a novel environment. So in this case, I'm going to introduce a lionfish to this reef community. It's successfully expanded into that new habitat. So it's having many babies. And then it has caused environmental or economic harm. So in the case of the lionfish, it eats the reef fish and it eats them in really large numbers and it has no predators. So the invasive species that I'm gonna talk about today is Sargassum horneri. Um, and I, I said it was invasive and uh, previous researchers have found that it um, is impacting or an economically and ecologically important fish, the kelp bass, actually won't recruit to sargassum. Uh, it will only recruit to native kelp forest. So that's um, one of the reasons why it can be considered an invasive species. It arrived in California in 2003 to the Long Beach Harbor, likely introduced uh, via a fishing vessel. Within three years, it had spread to three locations on Catalina Island. Since that time, it has spread over 750 kilometers from Santa Barbara all the way to Isla Natividad, Mexico, and likely even farther. Um, if you look it up on iNaturalist, you can see people posting photos of it as far north as Santa Cruz. Sargassum horneri is an annual species, so it lives its entire life cycle in one calendar year, uh, generally um, kind of starting growing in the winter. Um, becoming reproductive in the spring and then senescing through the summer and then you get the recruits kind of starting in the early fall. It grows to be about three meters in height. It's particularly well suited to invading because it is highly fecund and it's self-fertile so it can actually reproduce um, without uh, another plant. There's a lot of concern that Sargassum horneri is spreading into areas historically dominated by kelp forests. In Southern California, our kelp forests are characterized by cold nutrient rich waters and the dominant species is Macrocystis pyrifera or giant kelp. Uh, it's perennial, so it, it lives several years. It can grow to be about 30 meters, so quite a bit larger um, as a habitat structure than Sargassum horneri. So I'm interested in comparing a key ecosystem function, a resource subsidy that is provided by Sargassum horneri and Macrocystis pyrifera. And over the next couple of slides, I'll explain why, where, and how I did this work. So first things first, what, what actually is a resource subsidy? So it's described as a, or defined as a flow of resources from one community to another. Examples can include nutrients, organic matter, or larvae. Um, and it can augment the supply of critical nutrients, impact abundances of key species, and alter ecological processes. So rack um, algae that washes up on shore is a resource subsidy that comes from the marine environment to the terrestrial environment. So why is beach rack important? As a key resource subsidy to sandy beach communities, it provides habitat. So if you've ever been on a sandy beach, you might have noticed that it's kind of a flat expanse. There's not a lot of relief to it. Um, but when algae washes up shore, it creates these big long rack lines. Um, and it creates habitat. So it's creating this wet and moist environment um, for invertebrates to live in. 
and that then provides trophic support. Um, and so what do I really mean by that? So we have algae, um, and as it kind of starts to um, break down on the beach and decompose, it's eaten by invertebrates. Those invertebrates can be eaten by birds or lizards. And then especially those birds will go back and their guano fertilizes terrestrial communities. On Catalina, that might look some, like something like this. You have uh, kelp here eaten by these different amphipods and beetles and isopods. Those are eaten by birds. And then they feed uh, the, the grass up here and you see the little bison back there. Currently, Sargassum horneri is washing up as beach rack. And so I was really interested to see how this provides a resource subsidy um, compared to the native uh, Macrocystis pyrifera. Catalina Island has been particularly impacted by Sargassum horneri in some locations. It has become the primary placeholder and forms dense monocultures that look a lot like this. Um, so I conducted the field portion of my study on the leeward side of Catalina Island at the Two Harbors campground in Little Fisherman's Cove, so right there. Um, and I, Sargassum horneri and Macrocystis pyrifera coexist off Catalina's coast, and I've seen both wash up here as racks. So it was really the perfect place to conduct this work. So what did I do? I did a two-factor field experiment. So the first factor is algal species. Um, and I, like I said, did Sargassum horneri and Macrocystis pyrifera. And then I also looked at over time as, as the racks age. Um, so I looked at the racks in day one, three, nine, and 21. So I created 40 experimental racks, uh, 20 of each species. Um, and each day I collected five of um, sargassum and five of Macrocystis pyrifera. Uh, so five each of these days of each species. I randomly placed them along the rack line at Little Fisherman's Cove. And then the things I'm trying to look at are the total number of organisms and the species diversity. And then I also had a plan to monitor bird behavior, which didn't go quite as I expected. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So what did that actually look like? Uh, so this is Emily Reisner and myself collecting giant bags of algae to bring back to Wrigley. When we normally do algae research, Emily and I both work with kind of small individuals so we'll get those individuals, we'll put them into little nylon stockings, um, we spin them in a low velocity centrifuge or a salad spinner, um, and that gives us this consistent wet weight uh, so we know how much the algae weighs. But these ones we were working with were a lot bigger um, than those small ones, they definitely wouldn't fit in a nylon bag. Um, and so instead we use big large mesh bags, and instead of a salad spinner, we became our own centrifuges. So we spun algae over our heads for a minute and then weighed them using a fish scale. This is what the racks looked like when they were completed. So this is Macrocystis pyrifera, all wrapped up in trellis netting. We put it along the shore kind of like this, the brown ones indicating sargassum, the yellow ones, Macrocystis. This is what it looked like in actuality. So these are our racks all along that rack line. This is a picture of sargassum right when we put it out. This is a picture kind of towards that 21 days, starting to look a little bit raggedy. And so here is a rack. Uh, I would bag them when I was coming back in. You can see here, the video plays, these are all the flies that were captured. Um, and so trying to identify those now and figure out um, how many invertebrates were um, there. So it's my little amphipods and a lot of flies I was found in all of them. So what were the differences? I was really expecting to see that Macrocystis would have more invertebrates um, because it um, is native. And I just thought that they would be more used to that and, and that would be something to expect. And that's not at all what happened. Um, so here's a picture of a Macrocystis rack. You can see there's a couple bugs. Here's a picture of a Sargassum rack. Um, it's open overwhelmingly disgusting. Um, there's just a lot going on here. Um, and so now I'm working on identifying those invertebrates and comparing the species diversity. And I think that because the sargassum is so tightly wound, it stays wet longer and it becomes just a better habitat. And so it was colonized by a lot more bugs. So right now I'm working on that and sending out um, 
the racks for nutrient analysis. I didn't see any birds the entire time I conducted this experiment, so that was a little sad, um, but it definitely was interesting. So I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Peggy Fong, the staff at USC Wrigley, my dive buddy, Emily Reisner, lab mate, Shana Sura, and the rest of the Fong lab, as well as my funding sources. I'd be happy to take any questions. 